All right. So um, I'm still somewhat jet lagged. Um, I slept well the first night, but not the second. So I, hopefully I'm fairly coherent, but if you want any uh, corporate secrets out of me, I'll probably talk because I've been under duress. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, Lanto, for, uh, for inviting me into kind of in enemy territory. I'm a uh, Python guy, as we'll see. Um, and uh, kind of paralleling uh, things you've seen over the past few days, Get rid of this. Um, uh, I too started out with a lot of different languages and then ended up doing my PhD in um, C and C++, even though Scheme was my favorite language. Um, it's just the things I needed to do were more practical in, in C. And then eventually I got really sick of that. I did not recommend anyone uh, trying to do serious science in C. It's just seg fault after seg fault. Um, the speed is illusory. Yes, the code when it runs is fast. It doesn't matter because everything you do is just a series of errors and especially C++. I definitely don't recommend that. Um, so I've shorted those languages. Uh, anyway, um, switched to Python and initially I switched to Python thinking that, well, all the core number crunching is gonna have to be in C and uh, I'll just have this kind of uh, skin on top that makes things easy to configure. But over time, all the C went away. Eventually, there's no C left in anything I do nowadays. Um, we use uh, Numba to compile uh, Python into C. I know in Julia, you don't have to have kludgy extra things added to the language for this, but uh, it works for us. Um, and we also really uh, build on the fact that uh, well, we personally built on the fact that Python has become so popular. Um, I, I did that in 2015 to jump ship and get a higher uh, salary and more opportunities by leaving academia. Um, that wouldn't have been possible in, uh, if I'd been working in other languages. But Python, during the course of my, me working on Python, Python became extremely popular. It turned out I probably had nothing to do with it. Um, and then since 2015, I've been working full-time on Python. Before that, my full-time job was writing papers. Well, full-time job was writing grants. My students' full-time job was writing papers. Python was on the side. But then we took all those same tools uh, over the commercial world, took them out of the original context of neuroscience where we developed them and started applying them to different scientific domains one after the other and generalizing the tools. And nowadays, um, we kind of package that up as as a suite of tools called uh, Holoviz. We are not the greatest at coming up with good names, um, but we do have good tools. Now we have eight of them at this point, um, most of them dating originally from the academic work, but benefiting from a lot of corporate money and uh, government money that comes because of the popularity of Python. And nowadays I have uh, on my payroll, I have nine, uh, full-time staff working just on this library, which is pretty unusual for a, an open source, uh, not sorry, just on these libraries. Uh, it's pretty unusual to have that many full-time people working on open source. Um, and that's basically been my job is to figure out how to understand what a corporation needs and tell it back to them in terms of how open source will solve that problem and why they should give me money in order to solve the problem. And my usual stick or spiel is I walk in and I say, hey, tell me about your problems. And I listen and I say, okay, that's great. Those are real hard problems. 90% of them are solved by open source immediately. Um, if you give us money, we'll solve the rest of the, the other 10%. And if not, enjoy, you use open source and you work on solving that 10%. Either way is fine, great. And it's been true every single time. Um, they don't always say yes, but whenever they do say yes, it's been true. It has immediately solved 90% uh, of their problem. And the rest of the time, there's a lot of work. The, the rest of the problem uh, basically funds my group. So, um, and we started, uh, we had to have bootstrapping. It started with um, academia. We, just, we wrote these tools for our own purposes to solve our own needs in order to publish papers, in order to make figures for our papers. Uh, so we had something to walk in with. But as soon as we had that, we were able to basically um, 
spiral into more and more funding and a bigger and bigger team. And I'm pleased to still employ uh, two of my own PhD students. So they do all the real work and I uh, just watch. Um, and they've trained all the new people who come in. So it's, I've kind of set up a uh, research group within the corporate structure with corporate funding with the same people I was always working with and um, I'm still working on problems that are interesting. So I don't know if, uh, if anyone else talk about this model, uh, welcome to afterwards uh, as a way to uh, fund open source. As far as I know, it's unique. Uh, there are plenty of people who do consulting, but I don't know of anyone who does it quite this way. And I've been doing that for, for many years. It's been working out. All right, uh, to give you a kind of sneak preview into what, uh, what I'm gonna talk about, um, it's, I'm just looking at uh, Data Shader's um, Twitter feed. And this, is, this will be a bunch of plots by um, Data Shader users. Uh, and just to show you the types of things that I'll be getting to, but I'm gonna start from first principles. So in order that you're not totally bored during that segment, I'll show you the final, cut to the final result. So uh, this uh, background logo, this is essentially a uh, heat map of where people's mobile phones were in OpenStreetMap data. Um, a billion points dumped out to an image. Um, somebody at Instacart, the grocery delivery service in America has used this software to understand how uh, people, how their shoppers move through stores. Well, how they move through the city first, and then within the city, within the store, how they move through the store down the aisles um, to basically dump all of their data and visualize it um, in a way that helps them understand um, what they're doing. Um, let's see what else have we got here. Uh, here's uh, this is a good example of kind of the themes of my talk. If you Start with somebody who's trying to understand um, this particular uh, mathematical property. Great, they made a plot. And then someone came along with data shader and said, ah, you call that a plot? Here's a plot. I'm like, oh, okay, this is, uh, this is a different order of magnitude. This is a different way to understand what you're uh, getting at. And um, makes use of the fact that uh, there's really no reason to super subsample your data, if you could just render it all, which is what we'll end up doing. Um, here's everybody in the UK since, sorry, census. Um, I have no idea what that is. It's pretty. Uh, this is a, a UMAP embedding of a bunch of documents in different languages, each one of them colorized by their source language, showing that you map kind of groups. It's a dimensionality reduction technique for grouping things by similarity. And it's just showing that uh, things in a certain language tend to be grouped with each other. And there, there's no color key. Um, in fact, there was a challenge from the author to figure out which ones or which language. Um, I haven't seen this uh, appear yet, but it certainly looks pretty. There's some. Uh, if we get far enough, uh, there'll be some different types of plots. A few, I'm skipping over the ones that are from my group. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to see if, what else other people have done. Um, well, I'm skipping over plenty from other people as well. Um, a lot of these, I don't know what they are, um, but people thought they were pretty, so they posted them. Um, I think this is light. Yeah, this is LIDAR rendering. Um, oh, okay, this one's kind of cool. Uh, this is a virtual, this is where players were in a virtual world. PUBG, I don't even know what that is, some sort of game. I'm old, don't, don't bother me. Um, but this is where it's a massive online game. And so this is not GPS locations, but it's their locations as they're exploring their environment. And it's just showing they, they group in ways that are very similar to how humans group in, in reality. Um, and uh, there must be a bridge between these two virtual land masses. So they're constrained down to that and cross over that and so on. And it's the sort of thing that immediately you, you look at and you have questions. 
uh, uh, one to explore further. All right, so that's what we'll do here. And try to end up in things like that and tell you exactly what they mean and how you should interpret them and why. Um, all right, so uh, the structure of the rest of the talk is me going from first principles up to the final products, uh, hopefully inspiring you to write a similar tool in Julia, um, or at least uh, feel jealous, one or the other. Um, and then at the end, I'll show you lots of demos until somebody drags me down from here. So, uh, so uh, as was discussed, um, well, I want to have a, a narrow definition of what data visualization is in the computer era. Obviously, in the cholera um, uh, initial era, that was not this definition did not apply. But nowadays, it does apply pretty much. And you form of data visualization is about pixels. And so, which pixels? There's a pretty large space of possible pixels for any screen or any uh, printout. Which pixels do you choose? Well, you should be guided by some sort of principle for what a good data visualization is. And what I've showed you so far are some pretty data visualizations, but are they good? Well, to me, a good one is one that accurately conveys the properties of the data to a human. And this is very human specific. My background before this is in visual neuroscience. And so uh, actually when I arrived at, uh, at Anaconda, I was told that I was the biz expert. And I realized, oh, well, I guess I am. I was an open source person. I was producing things in Python and I was publishing on Vision. So I guess if I put those together, I'm, I'm Anaconda's biz expert. Okay. And that's, I, I, it, was, it did not strike me because I was, everybody who writes a paper is a biz expert, right? Everybody's got to make their visualizations, make their figures in order to get something published. So nobody wants to call themselves a biz expert, but you have to figure out how to do it. And if you add in uh, my visual system background, I made it. Okay, I guess that makes sense. So, um, so we'll try to figure out how to come up with a good data visualization. Um, and uh, this will uh, relax this later, but the basic idea is uh, similar to a chart you were just seeing. You have some observations in the simplest case that is just a two location in 2D plane. For value X, you measured uh, Y. For another value X, you measured a different Y and so on. And if you're trying to visualize this, my argument is that you should be able to see the distribution of this data uh, with making use of the full power of this system to show you all of the distribution, not just a linear fit to it, let's say. That'd be a very small of information for this massive number of pixels to convey to you about this distribution. That'd be an utter failure as a visualization, in my opinion. You should be able to convey the entire distribution, as much detail as possible on the screen of this resolution. At the same time, you should see things that are different from the, res from the distribution, and they should be visible immediately. You should see the trends and the outliers in the same plot immediately, or you're not able to understand this data set because some things you're gonna do with the data set will be disrupted by outliers, some will not. Some will be about the trends, some will be about the, um, the patterns of the trends. You should just see that. That's what the point of the visualization should be. And you should be able to do that without a chicken and egg problem of tuning parameters to reveal this, this distribution. If you ever have to tune a parameter in order to reveal it, you have no idea what the distribution was because it, it's your bias. It's your, what you're looking for when you're tuning those parameters. It should be parameter free. And you should also, in this era of modern data, um, just being awash in data, you should, be able to make use of all the data you have and your visualization should get better, not worse. And that has just not, have not, not been the case until now. The more data you have, the visualizations don't necessarily get better. So um, let's see how to get that. Well, um, and how much time do I have actually? Till a uh, quarter after, is that right? Okay, good. All right, so we came, science, um, Visualizations didn't just uh, come down from the mountain. They were created uh, in a certain era of science to solve problems that scientists were facing at that time. And when scientists worked for six years to get 12 data points, then this was a very appropriate way to display and understand those data points. And a basic scatter plot, 
lets you see, oh, all these blue ones over here, they might be from a slightly different distribution than all the red ones. You can kind of make it out. You can see every individual point. You could extract the numerical values if you wanted. Nothing wrong with this. Very good uh, visualization. But if we just have uh, 300 points in each of these plots, suddenly it's a very bad visualization because we can plot 300 points here, 300 points here. And if you try to combine them, the plot you get depends on the order that you plot them. This is systematically, all it's doing is it goes through the list, draws one, goes the next one, draws the next one. And if you do that, looking at the blue ones, uh, the red ones first, you get this plot, and you look at the blue ones first, you get this plot. And then if you're trying to answer a question about this data, what's more common, red or blue? Your answer is gonna depend entirely on the arbitrary choice of which one you did first. It's a horrible visualization. But this is standard plotting for 300 points. This is not big data. This is tiny data, but it's data that happens to be clumped or grouped in a way that uh, doesn't work out well. And uh, what if there was, what if right here, you had some error in your measurement, so you collected across 10 devices, but one of them always spit back the same point, two uh, comma one, or one comma two, but always spits back the same point and you had almost all of your points right there at the one spot, would you have any idea? It's gonna draw that point and draw that point and draw that point, and you can't tell the difference. So that's, that's again, an utter failure as a visualization. So that's not good. Okay, so that's called problem one, called overplotting. And this applies to scatter plots, but it applies to almost every plot in the standard toolbox. Line plots, same deal. As soon as you have if you have one line plot, fine. Two line plots or a line plot that doubles back on itself, not fine. Uh, pretty much any um, non-gridded uh, visualization. Okay, people have known this. There are things to do. Okay, immediately let's uh, let's try making plots uh, the points a little more transparent so that you can see when they overlap. Great idea. That's a big improvement. So here you can immediately see. Oh, look. There are several that line up, that add up here. Now, if you have enough of them, it'll just look red no matter how many points there are. So you're still, you haven't really solved it, but you certainly improved it. And when you overlay the two, now it still depends which order you do it. It's better. Like these two should look identical because the data is identical. The visualization of the data should not depend on an arbitrary choice. Um, so we, just, we chose an arbitrary value for opacity or transparency, and it almost sort of works, and we can tweak it. But do we know what we're doing when we tweak it, or is it just when it looks pretty? It's kind of an art, and it's, and it's an art that depends on the data, which is this cardinal sin. Any parameter setting that you have that has to be adjusted depending on the data is completely verboten. I guess I'm not supposed to use... Uh, borrowed German words when I'm in Germany, but uh, uh, anyway, you totally cannot use a parameter setting that depends on the data if your goal is to figure out what the data is. If your goal is to understand the data and you have a parameter setting that has to be changed differently depending on how many happen to overlap. If they're separated, you don't need opacity. When they're overlaid a little, you need a little opacity. When they're overlaid a lot, you need a little. That's every time you come up with a new plot, the overlap's gonna be different, so. Any sort of change in the clumping means a change in this value. Oh my God, this is horrible. Okay, well, people have techniques for that too. Let's make the dots smaller so that they won't overlap. Okay, great. Now, when you do that, there's, there's much less overlap. And these two almost are almost identical. Um, it's now pretty hard to see individual points, particularly because they're transparent. So again, you have, you have to, depending on the overlap, you have to set the size and now the transparency. That's a two-dimensional optimization problem on an unknown space. When your whole idea is, I just wanted to see this data. Oh my God, this is, I don't, people don't even talk about how bad this is. This is normal plotting in every plotting program ever on every language. This is just normal daily life and people accept it. It is unacceptable. It's acceptable when you had 10 data points. That's the only time it was acceptable. Everything after that, unacceptable. Oh my God. 
Okay, well, let's, what if we just say, we're only gonna plot 10 data points? Then you don't have any problems, right? Obviously that doesn't work, right? Because if you have any sort of interesting distribution, you need a lot of samples of it to figure out what the distribution is. Such as if you have two underlying generators, in this case, these are two different Gaussians just slightly offset in their locations. If they're at a glance, this looks like one distribution here, here, with enough points and enough tweaking and tuning, you can see that it's clearly two distributions uh, that have been merged. But you, I mean, if you, you saw this, maybe you say, oh, what's that little gap there? Maybe I'll investigate, or randomly, maybe you wouldn't see that little gap. You know, you're, you're either gonna notice this scientific phenomenon or you're not. You're just, this total luck. You wanna trust your science to luck? No. So this is a problem called the, uh, the first problem was called oversaturation. Sorry, the first problem was called overplotting, this coarse obliterating thing underneath it. The subtler version of that's called oversaturation, obliterating after a certain value, 10 points, 100 points. At some point, there will still be overplotting. It's just you postponed it 100 points into the future. That's it. The third problem is um, undersampling. If you try to deal, if you try to avoid the problem, you're not going to be able to um, do a good job. Uh, plus, um, there's a problem, another problem that's very less understood called undersaturation. This is three plots of the same data. This plot, you think, oh, that's a nicely two dimensional normal distribution. Um, fine, I, I can understand it. But it kind of illustrates the point that I was making earlier in the error case. Uh, but this actually is not meant to be modeling errors, it's meant to model reality. Um, this is actually the underlying data. I happen to know what it is because I made it up. It is the sum of five Gaussians, each with 10,000 data points. And all I did, the Gaussians just have a different center and a different uh, spread. So in this case, all 10,000 data points land in a couple of pixels. Here, those land in uh, slightly more pixels slightly larger, slightly larger, and then overlaid over all of it is a much larger spread. Now, if these data points were humans, such as geographical patterns, this is meant to model, uh, it's inspired by uh, geography. People tend to uh, collect in, uh, in localities of different spatial scales. So everyone's crammed into the high rise. They're also in the city center. They're also in the suburbs and they're also pretty much everywhere in between. And any sort of data set that we have that has this multi-scale phenomenon, it's gonna have this problem, which is if you just plot it, you get massive overplotting. And if you tune and tune and tune, you're gonna systematically ignore the background. That's called undersaturation because if you tune and tune, you get to see these patterns, four of them, but you completely miss the low count things that are spread out. And by construction, those are exactly as many people that are spread out as are in each one of these. Those are your rural voters. Now, there are 10,000 here, 10,000 here, 10,000 here. Those 40,000 voters show up, 10,000 voters do not show up because it's been tuned so that the saturation is low, so that when you add up 10,000, it doesn't overwhelm anything. And as soon as you do that, you lose all the background. That's called undersaturation. Some data points are present, but will never be perceived by you as a human. You can find them numerically, but you won't spot them, you won't realize them, you're systematically gonna misrepresent this data set. Okay, so maybe don't do any of that. Uh, alternative approach, those were all scatter plots. Every one of those plots is a traditional scatter plot. Iterate through the data, render it, move on to the next point, render that, and so on. Um, so the alternative approach is say, well, fundamentally the problem is that we're rendering and overriding and overriding and overriding, and we have no control over how that process results in a pixel that you finally see. There's no systematicity to how data points add up to a, something that you see as a, as a pixel. So what if we add systematicity? What if we aggregate per pixel in a way that is independent of order. And so in the simplest cases, a really coarse heat map, 
Uh, all you do is take every point, figure out what uh, bin it lands in and increment the bin. That's essentially a 2D histogram. That is the simplest case here. Um, and if you do that at different spatial scales, you can see that um, you, you see different patterns. In this case, uh, at the finest scale, you can see that this is a noisy Gaussian distribution and another additional Gaussian distribution next to it. You can see that very clearly here. Here you can see that it's a Gaussian, but you can't see that it's sparsely sampled. Here you can see that. These actually tell you different things about the data. This tells you the shape of the distribution. This tells you the sampling density of the distribution. And humans are actually pretty good at picking this kind of shape out of this kind of plot. So this kind of plot kind of tells you more, like it tells you both the sampling and the shape because we're very good at spotting that this clump of pixels is in fact a clump. That's what our visual system does. It's finding clumps whether they're there or not. So the result of this is very similar to this type of plot or this type of plot, but by construction, it has, and there's no size tuning, there's no opacity tuning, and there is no potential for overplotting. That simply, there is no, there's only one thing that's being plotted is the count per pixel. There's no, there's nothing that could be overplotted. It doesn't even exist, it's not a problem. So are we done? We are not done. Um, what about what this was when we applied the heat map to this um, to two equally equal count Gaussian distributions? What if we apply it to the case a minute ago of this five different ones, exactly the same data set? We knowing what I put into it, I want there to be hands off, no parameters. I want it to come out with the, the fact that there are 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, and 10,000. If we feed that into a heat map, this is what we get. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Well, in this case, it does sort of at a coarse level, it'll capture the, the fact that there's a big hotspot here and a hotspot here that land in that pixel. I call it a pixel, it's a bin, but in the limit, it's a pixel on your screen. Um, so that's sort of captured there, but you really have, I mean, that I would never deduce the structure of the data from looking at that picture. Over here, you pretty much have the same problem you did a minute ago. You can spot four hotspots and have no idea about the background. And then when you make it fine enough, you can see almost nothing. So why is that? Because right there, there are 10,000 points in one pixel. And if you're linearly mapping bin values from zero to 10,000, you pick black for 10,000. Now, what is the next gray up from white? It's going to be uh, a very large number that is not met anywhere else in this image. So pretty much everything gets uh, mapped to either black or white and nothing in the middle. Um, that's totally an undersaturation problem. It's the same problem you have in a scatter plot when you're tuning everything, but you have it right here. Okay, we can fix that. We can fix it because we are systematically constructing this heat map, not accidentally. It's not an emergent property of lots of parameters, I said. It's just deliberately being done. So you can map from this heat map to the visual uh, display however you want. So what if we say, hey, I'm going to map background color to counts of zero. The next value up of one, I'm going to choose not the next color up, but I'm going to choose a visible gray that is different from the background. This will completely eliminate undersaturation because it tells you immediately, is there data or no data? So that's, that's an improvement. You at least know in this region, there is data, but the plot is still very underwhelming. Why is that? Because everything is either zero for the background. Now it's got another color, this gray for non-zero, and then all the other colors are unused up until the top one. The top one is, it's still linearly mapping between the, uh, the lowest non-zero count of one up to 10,000. And that just maps everything into background or peak. There are no values in between because this is not a linear distribution of possible values. It's a distribution that goes like that. And that's normal. That's typical for data. It is normally like this. This is not a weird, 
failure mode. This is normal, typical data. And you'll see that. Okay, so that is um, the problem that's left here is called under, well, I made up this term. It's, I call it underutilized range. You have a range ready to give information to your visual system and you're not using it. You had all these values between zero and one and you chose zero and one. As an utter failure as a visualization to convey what this apparatus is possible, is capable of conveying to a human. And I'm a human, so I care. So, I, uh, so you need uh, nonlinear scaling, and that's because the data is nonlinear. And so, when the data is distributed nonlinearly and you use a linear scaling, you're failing to convey much about the data. If you do that, then you get this plot, which is finally satisfying to me, because I can walk up to it from anywhere and I look at it and I say, "Oh." Looks like there's a hot spot here and a somewhat bigger hot spot here and a somewhat bigger hot spot here and a somewhat bigger hot spot here. And then there's this background level that's falling off in every direction. I can just see that in the data without any parameter tuning, without any adjustment. I walk up and see that. And um, th I know that's what I put in. So I know that that's what I should see for this data. And that means I can see individual points because I'm still using the under the uh, under saturation mapping, so that if it's zero, it's, it's white, and if it's one, anything that's not zero is visibly different from zero. That way, I can still see all these outliers. And then I non-linearly map, in this case, according to a log function, um, into the color bar, and uh, get this plot. But I'm still unhappy because I love this plot; looks great. Where did log come from? I plucked it out of the air. Now it's a common thing. People often try linear log and there are deep reasons in the universe why, why log applies to many systems. I don't care about those. Those are biases and assumptions. They should not be in this process. This process is designed to reveal the data, not make a pre-picture. How do we know that this is an appropriate thing to do? So the last thing we're gonna do is instead of log, use a technique called histogram equalization from images. This basically what it does is percentile uh, mapping of the outputs so that the first 1% goes to low gray, the second 1% goes to the next gray, and the top 1% of the data goes to the darkest gray. That is parameter free. It is basically, I don't know what this data is, but I'm gonna show you the highest values, then the next clump of values, and the next clump of values. with zero parameters to dump it out and see. Now, I, I think this looks prettier. And we're working on that. I think there's an algorithm that is not histogram equalization. Well, we have it. We've demonstrated. We're trying to publish it. We have a, something that kind of results in a better looking one. Meanwhile, this is already published. This is standard technique. And it is parameter free. And it always works pretty well. If it's linear data, the resulting color map is linear. If it's log data, the resulting color map is roughly log. And um, no matter how bad your outliers is, are they will land in one one color bin and it's there you can actually detect it and I'll highlight that if you want uh, but it doesn't destroy the rest of the data so uh, there's still one more problem and we've already talked about this one you did all this work and you get a beautiful thing and you're about to visualize it and you throw jet at it no <laughs> Okay. And often when you throw jet or hot at something, it doesn't matter because you're, you had so many mistakes all the way up to that point. It doesn't, who cares? But in this case, we've been very careful every bit and don't throw it away at the very end, right when you're about to succeed. If you do that, then you get a plot like this where you can't see the structure because everything's kind of been mapped over this regime where all the colors kind of look the same. And you get these weird banding, all these yellows kind of look the same. Uh, no, use a perceptually accurate color map and it's going to work out just fine where the difference between any two colors is visible to a human. It should be a comb where you see every bit of that comb. Um, I mean, it's up to you. This is, this is personal. So if you see a, a, a nice comb here where it doesn't go way up high or way down low as you go left to right, then this is a perceptually accurate color map for you. And for me, it, it, it does. I did not construct it. I did sort of wheedle someone into constructing it for me. 
but I, what they did works for me, even though I wasn't involved. All right, so that's a data shader, and then I'll just show some demos. Um, this is Python code. So I focused on non-Python since those are the things that apply to everybody here. But if you happen to be using Python, then you're in luck. You can use data shader. Uh, this is the code for it. You'll notice that it has no parameters and you get this plot out of it. Um, like here's, here's that code running in Python. Uh, this is actually using uh, data shader plus hollow views plus bokeh, our whole hollow is stack. Um, if you do that, you, you can um, uh, zoom in. You'll see the data shader updates the plot as you go in. There's, an, there's another thing I didn't say, which is that uh, this integration with the plotting library um, looks at the resulting aggregate, sees if um, there are any counts above one, uh, see if all accounts are only one, and if so, it spreads each pixel so you can see it. So it actually get results in the same plot you would have at the scatter plot in the limit when you zoomed in, but when you zoom out, you can see the distribution. So um, this is a default parameter-free way to just explore any data set and immediately see oh, what's that spot? What is that spot? And you zoom in. And eventually you zoom into all the points and just figure everything out. Go around. And that's 10,000 points. That is a million point. And go for a million points. I don't know. 10 million points. Doesn't care. This is all um, heavily uh, optimized as you zoom in. Maybe it got a little bit slower for 10 million points. Um, but it's doing something really stupid really fast. This iterates through all of them, puts them in a grid. You can do that without a lot of work. That's data shader. Uh, it builds on Numba, so this is uh, compiled Python and Dask, so that it can handle an arbitrarily large data set. Dask assembles as many things as you can afford, as many processors just distributed. This is all easily distributed. You got a 50 billion billion point data set, put it in chunks, give each chunk to a different processor. It's all that can all be done independently and then assembled. So it's basically scales to anything. And it's uh, crucially, this is not just a 2D um, histogram. That's just the default. It's an aggregation, a user defined aggregation. And so, talking about 2D color maps, you can define a, an aggregation of the mean, an aggregation of the standard deviation per pixel. And then you see not the value, but the value colored by the uncertainty. You, do, you can always render both of them at once. And, and then you can do math on it, you can do amazing things. Data Shooter is not a visualization library. It's a rasterization library, a rendering library. The result is arrays, and you can do whatever you want. In the typical case, immediately you visualize it. You can actually do anything you want with it. And I won't get into the steps involved, but you can probably guess you start with data, eventually get a plot embedded in it, and you have to do some work. All right. Um, so a couple of Little demos. I just wanted to start with this one about flux maps. Uh, since we had that in the first talk, I don't have any idea what this means. This is not my field at all, but it is FluxNet data, and it's showing something that normally you'd put in, you'd put some um, uh, regressor line on it and say, "Oh, it looks like things are correlated or not." And you can actually zoom into these and figure out all sorts of interesting structure. I don't know how much of this is real, how much of it is noise different sensors. I don't know, not my data. Somebody could figure this out. Um, that's an example on examples.pybiz.org called flux or something, garbage flux. <laughs> Other examples um, are, uh, let's see, uh, here's one um, with uh, GPS locations of ships around the coast of the United States colored by their uh, category, uh, whether a cargo or whatever. And then here it's using a new thing that's not quite ship, which is when we render everything to the histogram, to the, to the bins, we get data values. At the same time, we save an index of the data value. So think about we've got 
In this case, it's 300 million points. We're rendering to a fixed size image so it can display in a web browser, no problem. And we only, and this is all done server side. So we render it down and we put this image in here. And if we uh, zoom in, we'll get um, uh, an updated uh, value of the image. It'll render at, on the server. So this is the previous version that the other resolution will take a while and then it renders the new resolution. But every time it does, it actually is rendering, um, it, it's keeping track of at least one data point per pixel. So when you see something weird like this here, what is that circle? In fact, there's a circle on the middle of land over here somewhere. Um, where you have to, you can hover over it and see exactly what ship that was and figure out, look that up, because that's something, that's something wrong, particularly the one that's over land, which is over here somewhere. And so whenever you see something weird, you see the bulk, you see the distribution, you see the outlier, and you go hover over the outlier and you see exactly what's going on there. And so you can look it up. So this is data shader uh rendering but it's also data shader um uh, allowing you to explore individual points and then we can have as many uh plots as we wanted to i just want to make the point oh here's one uh lazaro i think is listed here this is um again parameter free these are all beautiful things you'll see people publish beautiful plots all the time they've been tweaking and adjusting and making it pretty there are no tweaks here Nothing. This is just a perceptually accurate color map on top of the raw output done by data shader. Whatever this was in this distribution goes up. And uh, very last bit. This is still running. Uh, this is alarming. This is uh, data shader rendering census data from America. You can go and look at my uh, hometown of Houston. You'll see that uh, racial segregation is pretty bad. Asians live in Asian town. Um, over here is uh, Hispanics live in this, uh, blacks here, whites here. And you can do this down to individual data points all the way down into the neighborhood and just immediately see things that, whoa, I see America's mostly white, except near the border, and then explore anything. This type of data really compels people to just go into it and explore it and then complain about gerrymandering. This is Houston, that's a district. Yikes. All right, um, I think that's it. Oops, that was not it. I wanted to point out, those were all, the, the standard things are all data uh, scatter plots, but the same thing applies to lines, and particularly for anybody who, there are some things in this conference if you have this is one million lines overlaid and so you can see the trends in the lines and the outliers and you hover over that outlier wait a minute what's that weird one? Oh, nothing okay we move on but it's uh and it's, uh polygons i didn't demonstrate that but um uh, grids as well for grids there's less benefit it's just basically fast because grids are already gridded um so basically so if you want to walk away thinking what is data shader it's a principled means for turning anything into a raster. Anything, literally anything. As soon as you've got that, you can do all sorts of cool things with it. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, questions, comments? A lot. <laughs> okay, Julius. Um, I wanted to say that in the in the example with the five different distributions, wouldn't you say that? while this algorithm allows you to see that there are distributions that it doesn't accurately represent the importance of the distributions and that is like a separate issue importance yeah because like even though i can see that there are five different distributions i don't see that in terms of numbers they are all of the same all oh, right yeah yes uh, that is part of the ongoing work down uh, here which is um Data shader is a separate project and it renders arrays. But actually, putting them on your screen requires either dumping to a PNG, which data shader can do, or if you want axes and you want color bars and you want labels, then you uh, get um, um, then you embed it in bokeh 
and we're making bokeh be able to reveal all of those things with uh, color bars that are meaningful. That's already in there. In most cases, legends, that's almost in there. This is fake. Um, and then you can do things like this. Um, Uh, here, here we've taken that top pixel and colored it red. This is going to tell you all of the outliers. So you can not only have a color bar, which is not there right now, showing you that it goes from two, and then one of the upper colors is two million. And then you realize, then you can see, oh, okay, the white here is actually not just a little more than two, it's two million. And you hover over it and you see that it's two million. And then here we specifically isolated the top 1% of dense pixels in America. And so like, if you really care about outliers, you have the actual data immediately accessible to do whatever you want before you display it. And so you, you care about outliers, highlight your outliers, do something about them. Care about low, low values, highlight those. If one particular value at the breakdown in income tax bracket, whatever, highlight that. Do whatever you want because it's all accessible to you. Emma? Uh, I was just wondering um, how you scale um, these pretty heavy rendering um, on a website. Um, is that with Bask just scheduling a job for every user that visits the um, website for the ship example? For the ship example, it's a single process in the world that we hope becomes not very popular. Okay. <laughs> that has been my It is not, there's no <laughs> auto scaling, there's nothing. Um, that is on the uh, to-do list of um, uh, WASM support. Our, all of holovis.org has excellent WASM support except for Data Shader because Data Shader depends on Numba compiler. Numba depends on LLVM Lite. LLVM Lite is not yet available on WASM. When it is though, then, then you basically distribute it all client side. At the moment it's server side. So you visit, it's great. If you tell 100 friends, it's still great. If you tell 1,000 friends, it, it's gonna be horrible. Okay. <laughs> And this is really focusing on a user and the research group trying to understand their data. This is, you can actually tell it to render web maps of static images that are used at different resolution. You can let that run for a week, dump that on a web server, and then you can support the public. So this is about instant access to your data for you and your friends. It's not very democratic that way. So uh, I had a question about that ship example that you showed. What strategy would you use because there are a lot of ships which you know there are a lot of parts which, which intersect each other but the ships are different and the colors are different so when you have this sort of categor categorical thing yeah how do you decide which which color to show on the pixel so that's um that's where my visual background comes in i try to approximate i, I number one i assume infinite, infinite data and then i try to approximate infinite resolution so if you had infinite resolution what would it look like if each one were merged to a single cell. Well, we do color mixing. So if there are 30% of them are one category, 20% another and so on, the corresponding colors are mixed in color space. And that, so that you, when you see a, a spot to zoom into, um, you see the merged value at the top level and then you explore and say, hey, that's actually, a, I can't tell, is that right here? What is that? That's kind of this, this pinky orange color. So you zoom in to this pinky orange color, and then it'll re-render with more pixels per pixel, and you can see the result. And so if you zoom in and you see things grammatically change as you zoom in, that's a failure. It should be as if you're approaching the infinite resolution data getting closer. That's what we're implementing in Bokeh right now. Totally not done in any plotting library. No questions? Um, would you feel severely misunderstood if I would like summarize your take home message as always do the histogram normalization on your plots. First step, do histogram normalization. Then once you understand the data and it's safe, then you can put log on it for your publication. And everyone's trusting you that log is correct for your data and that it's reasonable. And it's on you as a scientific um, researcher to not mislead your audience. You can take that log data and plot it with a linear and look, look, nothing matters with this peak. You're lying to your audience, but you can do that. You can change your, uh, your plot to use any color map you want. But my strong recommendation, that's why it's a default, even though it's this weird nonlinear mapping, is first show it to you, first make you aware. And then if you say, well, yeah, but really it, the impact of this is linear, 
And so I want to plot it linear. Okay, that's domain knowledge that you're putting in there. Sure, plot it, but you'll do it with the full knowledge that there's all this structure that you're covering up. And that's fine, maybe that structure isn't really important. You know it's not important, it's not your audience, you know they won't care and it doesn't mislead them. Go for it. But first, you understand it at the time of the research. Okay, and then I should also use like a good parameter. Is there, what, what's your, what's your off the shelf recommendation? I don't want to think about other map. Spray. <laughs> Fair enough. It's pretty obvious to everybody in the universe what that means. Okay. Uh, so yeah, my typical example is used with fire because it's uh, it's eye catching. But roughly, you're just appreciating the gray aspect about it anyway. So yeah, I would use gray for the basic, no colorblind problems, nothing. Long shot. Not into that much into visualization expert, but uh, I had one thought maybe you can comment on the decision. So what is the benefit of percentile mapping over rank mapping? Over what? Rank map. It's no different. Oh, it's different. That's why I'm asking. Okay. <laughs> so it's doing none of those. So it's similar. As you far mean? as I as far as I'm concerned, there so what it's doing is it's histogram normalization. So it's taking a histogram and it's attempting to flatten it. Now that's an approximation to percentile mapping, approximation to rank mapping. For this purpose, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you want to implement that uh, multiple ways to approximate this and, and display it, then I'd love to see the, the detailed differences. But for my talk, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so it's deeper if you have uh, some points that have higher counts. Uh, like in right, which in percentile mapping you might even end up with not having that many percentiles as you expect. Right. So yes, that's a. I I hope to spawn a bunch of people to care about that a lot, and publish detailed analysis and come up with a better one. I just said people use this in in images. I want something that's parameter free. Oh, it works. Okay, great. And uh, beyond that, I don't, I don't care. I, I want it to be great, but I, I know this is just better than everything. And so it's a baseline, and I'd love to see that baseline be improved in super uh, principled ways. This is exactly the algorithm you ought to use because it conveys exactly the maximum amount of data the human visual system can do, the minimum bias, and so on. I'd love to see that paper, but that's not it. I, I think you answered my first question, was, uh, which was how you would apply this to your initial example of the blue and red colors, which I think you would simply just have some purple. That's right. It'll, it'll all be purple. That's accurate. It yeah. is purple. Yes, purple. Yeah. That's correct. At this pixel, at this location in data space, it is not blue. It is not red. It is a mix. And that'll, that's what it'll convey. But I can't help feeling a little bit about this equalization histogram because you said, well, it, it's going to be log. If it's log, it's going to be linear. But it's linear. A, but that's going to be hidden from the... You are right, you can't see. With the color bar, uh, uh, I don't have time to pull it up, but if you see the color bar, the, the numbers on that color bar are crazy. It's it. 0. 0.2765, 0. 0.2767, 1, 200 billion. Yes. And you see that immediately. So you will, you will immediately know something is up. Yeah, so you do need the color bar. What's because, yeah, because what you actually have here is a mixture distribution, right? You have five different distributions. So it's not going to be anything. It's just going to be up and down, and the color bar is going to be. Oh, yeah, yeah. With that there. one, I chose the sizes roughly spaced in log space, but I, you can adjust them so that they're clumped here and here, and the result will not be log. It'll be uh, representation here, representation here, everything in the middle goes to one color. So exactly that. And you need the, the color bar. The thing is, the color bars were added to Bokeh long after we wrote all these examples. They motivated adding nonlinear color bars to bokeh, and then we have to systematically go through and update everything. And we're lazy and uh, tired. We're not lazy, we're tired. <laughs> <laughs>